Foreign and Peace Report. On Wednesday night, the Institute for Policy Studies presented its 30th annual Latelier Moffat Human Rights Awards in Washington, D.C. One of the main award winners, though, Maher Arar, was unable to attend. He remains on the U.S. no-fly list, even though his own government in Canada has publicly acknowledged he's an innocent man. Arar is the Canadian citizen who was abducted by U.S. officials at Kennedy Airport in New York in 2002, transported to a jail in Syria, where he was held for 10 months and 10 days in a cell that resembled a grave. He was beaten. He was tortured. He was forced to make a false confession about having ties to al-Qaeda. Eventually, he was released without charge. He became the first survivor of the U.S. government's secret extraordinary rendition program to speak out. In September, the Canadian government cleared his name and criticized the Bush administration for its actions. Well, at last night's awards ceremony, a video message from Maher Arar was shown. Hello, my name is Maher Arar. Sorry I could not join you for today's ceremony. All CCR staff and I are humbled to have been chosen this year's recipient of the Little Yay Moffat International Human Rights Award. This award means a tremendous amount to us. It means that there are still Americans out there who value our struggle for justice. It means that there are Americans out there who are truly concerned about the future of America. We now know that my story is not a unique one. Over the past two years, we have heard from many other people who, were, who have been kidnapped, unlawfully detained, tortured, and eventually released without being charged with any crime in any country. My nightmare began on September 26, 2002. I was transiting through New York Airport, JFK Airport. When they asked me to wait in a waiting area, I found that to be strange. Shortly after, some FBI officials came to see me, and they asked me whether uh, I was willing to be interviewed. My first and immediate reaction was to ask for a lawyer, and I was surprised when they told me that I had no right to a lawyer because I was not an American citizen. Eventually, on October 8th, against my will, they took me out of my cell. They basically read a piece of document to me saying that we will be sending you to Syria. And when I complained, I said to them, I did explain to you that if I'm sent back, I will be tortured. And they, I remember the INS person flipped a couple of pages in this document to the end of this document and read to me a paragraph that I still remember until today. It's extremely shocking statement she made to me. She said it's something like, the INS is not the body or the agency that signed the Geneva Convention, Convention against torture. For me, what that really meant is, we will send you to torture and we don't care. After 12 hours of detention, unlawful detention in Jordan, I was eventually driven to Syria. And I just didn't want to believe that I was going to Syria. I always was hoping that someone, a miracle would happen. The Canadian government would intervene. A miracle would happen that would take me back to my country, Canada. I arrived in Syria that same day, at the end of the day, and I was able to confirm that I was, in fact, in Syria after my blindfold wa was removed and I was able to see the pictures of the Syrian president. My feeling then, my feeling then is I just wanted to kill myself because I knew what was coming. I knew that the Americans, the American government, sent me there to be tortured. Maher Arar, in a video message uh, last night, awarded the Latelier Moffat Human Rights Award in Washington, D.C., by the Institute for Policy Studies. He was awarded by Vanessa Redgrave. You can turn to our interview with her that we did yesterday on Democracy Now! at our website, democracynow.org. And we'll put Maher Arar's full video statement on our website, democracynow.org, as well. 
Well, joining us right now in our firehouse studio is the British journalist who helped expose the Bush administration's secret CIA rendition flight. Stephen Gray has just published a new book. It's called Ghost Plane, the true story of the CIA torture program. The book covers the case of Maher Arar as well as dozens of other men who've been disappeared by the CIA and U.S. military. Welcome to Democracy Now! Hi. How did you first learn about these renditions? Well, funnily enough, I was first told about renditions by a man who became the head of the CIA, uh, Porter Goss. He was then a congressman and head of the House Intelligence Committee. And he told me, uh, I asked him whether they would find a way of capturing bin Laden. And he said, oh, it's, this is called rendition. Do you know about this? And I said, no, I have not heard of it. Um, he said, it's a way of bringing people to a kind of justice. Uh, and that really set me on the trail to, to uncover this whole whole network of, uh, of prisoner deten detention in, in secret. And so where did you go from there? Well, when the Guantanamo Bay camp was opened up in, in Cuba, and we saw all those images of those prisoners there, I asked about this. And, and some people who are close to the CIA told me, look, this is the press release. This is what they want you to see. This is where they're taking the cameras. But you should know there's a much wider system of detention of camps around the world where people are being taken. And that really inspired me to try and, you know, get, get behind that and find out where they all were and what was happening to them. And in fact, you know, quite soon afterwards, well, a few months of, uh, actually a, a year later, when, I, when Meher Arar was first released, he was one of the first uh, victims of, of the rendition program to come out. And he described so compellingly what happened to him and how he was taken in this Gulfstream jet, this executive jet, which seemed so bizarre. Uh, he'd flown across the Atlantic from America to, to Syria and describe the, the, the terrible torture that he faced. That also quite inspired me to sort of find out what happened to everyone else. And as you know, that use of these planes proved to be quite a clue as to how we could unlock this whole scandal. Now, you actually were able to pinpoint the plane that Maher Arar was put on when he was sent to Syria? That's right. I mean, I was able to find that actually the movements of these private jets, probably through some errors by the agency and others involved, uh, were quite easy to track around the world. So I found out not only his plane, but a total of about 20 different planes used by the CIA and, and allied agencies uh, to, tra to, to, to move people around the world. I got thousands of flight plans of these planes. What was important was you had people like Mehera and others coming out and making these statements of rendition. I was sent to Egypt, Morocco, Syria. Um, and you wondered, you know, should you believe these people? They're accused of being terrorists, etc. You wanted to find out some way of verifying their statement. And the importance of these planes was it allowed us to confirm precisely that exactly what they said had happened uh, was, was true. So tell us, um, what was the company that owned the plane? What was the plane? How did it work? Well, one of the main companies that uh, has been used for these renditions is uh, called Aero Contractors. Uh, it's a company based in North Carolina. That's A-E-R-O? That's right, yeah. And this is a company that is at the center of the CIA's uh, aviation network. I was initially wondering whether it was just a normal private company that perhaps had a contract with the CIA. But as we dug into it more deeply, we discovered it actually was the CIA. And I eventually found some pilots who, who used to work there who described how they got their job working for aero contractors by being interviewed by the CIA. There was an advertisement. Uh, there were adverts from the CIA saying, you know, we need all these kind of people, including pilots. And they replied to those jobs. They got vetted by the CIA. They got put on what they called the box, the polygraph, in a, in a hotel not far from the CIA's headquarters in Langley, Virginia. Finally, they were taken to Langley and provided with a series of, of cover identities, uh, false aviation licenses, false credit cards, false driving licenses. By the, by the CIA. Funny enough, actually, one of them involved said that he was given a form to sign when he joined the CIA, saying, I will never claim I'm from the CIA. I'll never say I'm a CIA employee. He, he signed the form, but the CIA kept all, all the copies. But he knew who he was working for, and, he, and uh, they all spent many years working with the uh, CIA around the world. It's, it's definitively uh, a CIA operation. And where did they fly Maharar out of, uh, from the New York area? Yeah, he was fl flown out of um, at the local airport here in, in, in New Jersey, Teterboro, um, picked up there. Uh, there was an FBI involvement in that particular operation because it came out of uh, New York. 
um, the, the U.S. airspace. So it, it wasn't a sort of typical rendition. My understanding is the CIA took over. He was flown from from Teterboro to John F. Kennedy, sorry, to Dulles Airport, where a new team took over, and then he was flown from there to via Athens, sorry, via Rome in Italy, and then the plane landed in, in, in Jordan. At that point, I think the CIA took over. He was then taken, he was beaten in Jordan, uh, and then he was driven over the border into Syria to this place you've, you've mentioned, the Palestine branch. It's one of the worst interrogation centers in the world. And what I found out what I've in, in this book, in researching this book, that when he got there, uh, he wasn't the only person that had been sent there by the United States. Um, up to seven other prisoners were sitting in these same cells about the sizes of, of graves, um, three foot wide, six foot wide. And up to seven of the prisoners there at the time had all been sent there by the United States. Are they still there? Well, some of them are. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole story of this rendition program is that there are only a few people who've emerged to tell their stories, and so many others have, have disappeared completely. We don't know where they are. There's no accountability as to what's happened to them. Um, there was one man uh, connected with the Hamburg cell, and probably a, you know, a, suspect, a, a suspected terrorist who was sent there in December 2001. He's quite a big man. He couldn't even fit in, in the cell, uh, and he's been held there for uh, over a year in this tiny solitary cell, beaten and beaten constantly. Um, and never brought to trial. So although people say that he's a man who's uh, been involved in, in the 9-11 attacks, uh, he was deliberately sent to a place where he couldn't be brought to trial, where we couldn't hear the evidence against him. So we don't know the truth about these, these allegations. We're talking to Stephen Gray, an award-winning investigative journalist who's contributed to the New York Times, Newsweek, The Atlantic Monthly, many other publications first exposed the rendition program back in 2004. His book is called Ghost Plane, the true story of the CIA torture program. We'll be back with him in a minute. international radar freedom drowns here on democracy now democracynow.org the war and peace report i'm amy goodman we're continuing our conversation with stephen gray has authored ghost plane the true story of the cia torture program um, you have documented in this book something like what 87 people who have been the victims of this program that's right yeah why is it called extraordinary rendition well it's extraordinary because of the way that it was transformed from a program that brought people back to justice in the United States to a public trial before a, before a judge and jury to a program that took people to places where they wouldn't face such justice. So rendition itself has been around for a long time, in fact, since the 1880s, and has always been about you know, snatching people where you wanted in the world. It's been legal in, the, in, in US law, not, in other, not perhaps in other countries, but in the 1990s, uh, they started using it to send people to other countries. So it actually started under, under President Clinton. But the difference that occurred after September 11th it, was that it greatly expanded, but also it was used after that period to send people to places where there weren't even any charges against them. It was used to, to, to take people off the streets uh, that, they didn't, that, that were considered a threat and were sent to countries where they had no connection at all. I mean, Meher Rawat, if you know, as you know, was a Canadian citizen who was sent to Syria 
Um, we've got uh, Egyptian citizens sent to Libya. We've got Ethiopian citizens sent to Morocco. Really showing how it was used as a method of outsourcing of interrogation, not simply just to imprison people somewhere else. Talk about the case of Mohammed Haider Zamar. Right. Well, he was one of the key suspects in, uh, from 9-11. In fact, when he was captured, he was captured in Morocco in December uh, of 2001. He was one of the first people in U.S. custody uh, for the 9-11 attacks. And you would have thought that after um, those attacks, when the FBI and, and the other agencies were given the mission of finding those responsible, that he would have been held by the United States, brought to trial perhaps, questioned in, in, in New York. But in fact, he was sent to Syria. His interrogation was outsourced to Syria. And I got hold of a, a German intelligence report, um, which specifically states how the US organized that transfer to Syria. And what's more, there were trade-offs involved. They asked the Moroccan government, which was involved in that transfer, um, sorry, they asked the European Union not to criticize Morocco over human rights because of this transfer, because of Morocco's cooperation in the war on terror. So you see that behind this network of transfers and co cooperation, there are trade-offs in the way that we deal, we, 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 we soft, soft glove some of the people that we would otherwise criticize over human rights. Well, I mean, astoundingly, Syria itself. You had President Bush just a few weeks ago at the UN General Assembly calling Syria the crossroads for terrorism. Yet, behind the scenes, the U.S. is cooperating with Syria in having prisoners sent there to be tortured? Well, I think the, the, the contradictions here have been so apparent that the relationship probably has deteriorated recently. But even going back to this period, uh, busy period after 9-11, 2001-2002, at that point, the State Department was saying very clearly that people would be tortured in Syria. Um, the Syrian regime was put on the the candidate list, if you like, of the axis of evil. It was stated very clearly this is a country condemned by George Bush for its legacy of torture and oppression. And at the same time, they were sending people to Syria. And the, 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 the key thing was this was a covert operation. It, it was embarrassing. And, and it's, it's still the most embarrassing country for the administration because they've talked about their agenda of spreading freedom and democracy in the Middle East. And yet the same people who are preventing that democracy from happening, the secret police of these countries, uh, are on the other hand referred to as liaison partners in the war on terror, people we work with. The same people who are locking up dissidents who want to bring the kind of democracy that everyone, I think, in the United States would like to see in these countries. Stephen Gray, last December, uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice said, the United States has not transported anyone and will not transport anyone to a country when we believe he will be tortured. Well, it's not true. And I think she knows that. They have preserved the legal fiction when they've sent people to these countries by asking those countries, sometimes just verbally, to say that they won't be tortured, to say that they were given a fair treatment, they'll be brought to trial. But what was interesting in, in researching this book was I went back to some of the people involved in this rendition program from the earliest period. And they said quite categorically, some of these people you know, believe that rendition is a good thing and they still defend it. But the one thing they're absolutely clear about is they told everyone in concern, they told the White House, they told the directors of the CIA, uh, they told the State Department, that sending people to these countries would involve torture. They knew it would be, there would be torture involved. And all those promises that they got were, were a legal fiction. And everyone, one of the ambassadors, the United States ambassadors to Egypt told me there was a kind of nod, nod, wink, wink that went on. They knew perfectly well these people would be tortured. So when Condoleezza Rice says that they had credible promises these people wouldn't be tortured, she's not telling the truth. Stephen Gray, Right now, there are investigations going on um, of people being kidnapped off the streets. For example, in Milan, the sheikh who was kidnapped. Can you talk about the prosecutors and the, was it two dozen CIA agents who were involved with this? That's right. And um, they left a trail of clues behind them. them. They were um, quite surprising in the way they allowed themselves to be, un to be uncovered. What happened there was there was a man called Abu Omar. He was under investigation for involvement in terrorism and the Italian prosecutor involved wanted to bring him to court in fact if he was still in Italy now
he would be in court. He would have been prosecuted in a normal way, uh, in an open court. They were collecting evidence against him. But what happened instead was that in February of 2003, he was snatched off the streets and taken in a, a series of executive jets via Germany to a jail cell in Cairo where he says he was severely tortured. Did, he was released briefly and he made a phone call back home to his family in Milan and explained what had happened to him, how he'd been kidnapped. And because Italian police were listening to that phone call, this, the story was revealed. Uh, he was quickly rearrested after making that call. Presumably the Egyptians were listening too. But that unlocked that whole scandal in, in, in Italy and the Italian prosecutors who believe that terrorists should be prosecuted in a court of law rather than being tortured in a jail cell in Egypt have pursued this case absolutely vigorously and there's going to be a trial very shortly of these CIA agents involved. There are arrest warrants for them. None of them have been caught, perhaps they never will be, but there will be an open trial perhaps held in, in their absence. It's going to take place in Italy and we'll expose further details of this whole uh, operation. What about Khaled al-Masri and the German investigation that's going on into that? Well, this is a pretty live story. Um, the German government have treated the rendition of their citizen, Khaled al-Masri, from who was on holiday in Macedonia in Eastern Europe. He was picked up and flown to a CIA prison in Afghanistan, held for five months without any charges, without any accusations made against him, finally released uh, without any compensation, without any apology, without any confirmation by the, the CIA that they carried out this act. He has returned to Germany and, and made the complaint to the German government. And what's interesting is the German government are treating that as a criminal offense, as a suspected kidnapping. And now they're looking to find those responsible. And it looks like in the f coming weeks they're going to issue arrest warrants for some of the people they believe carried out that transfer from, <coughs> from Macedonia into Afghanistan. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things we've been, ha we've, in order to investigate this story, I've had to try and trace some of the companies involved, some of the individuals to try and prove what has been kept secret, the fact that the US government has been responsible for these transfers. And, you know, we wouldn't have had to do any of that. We wouldn't have had to dig into any of these uh, CIA uh, operations if the government had actually just come clean and said, yes, we're the ones that were responsible for this transfer and if we made a mistake we'll apologize there's a you know an old phrase um trust but verify if you want to trust these people uh you want to send prisoners to countries like uzbekistan for example where they where they where they boil prisoners alive they've been known to do that i mean i don't know how many people have been treated in that way but it's a country run by an ex-communist who's known for that treatment well if we're going to send people to that country the least you can do is confirm that you've done that instead of taking part in a disappearance, take part in an open procedure where there's a chance of verifying how these people have been treated. But in fact, the whole program has been you know, protected by secrecy and it's, it kind of forced us to do all these investigations just to prove what's been going on. We're talking to Stephen Gray. He's author of Ghost Plane. You make the argument in your book uh, that these, the harsh treatment, that the torture, that the extraordinary renditions that are used to talk about fighting the war on terror is actually hurting the war on terror. How? Yeah, it's not a point that I really make myself, but a point that is made to me by many of those in involved people, some of the most experienced people in fighting to counter insurgency around the world, uh, military officers and, and, and CIA uh, and former CIA operatives. It's hurting because I think you have to go back to what would people like Osama bin Laden like us to do, what do they want us to do? They want us to torture, they want us to take our oppressive acts because that wins recruits to their causes. Um, it's an old lesson of, uh, an old method of, of terrorists. Take a small minority extremist group, how do they win support? How do they turn themselves into a mass movement? The answer is, uh, take, make a, 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 cause a terrorist action, kill an innocent people, provoke an enormous reaction which rounds up people who are innocent, uh, causes people to, to want to take revenge for what's happened to their families. And this is what's happened. There's been a massive reaction. There are people who've been turned into terrorists as a result of some of the repressive actions that have taken place. And rendition is, is, is one of those repressive actions. Stephen Gray, I want to ask you about Venezuela. 
Um, in your book, you write, the data exposed secret operations by the CIA around the world, even the presence of planes previously used by the CIA in Venezuela at the time as activists there were alleging the CIA was plotting a coup back in 2002. Right. This is a story that, that needs further investigation, and I, and I, I mention it because it, I think it's quite important to, 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 to know what really happened there and whether the CIA was involved and other agencies in trying to prevent uh, Chavez from, from taking power in Venezuela. What we do know is that there were allegations of a coup attempt against Chavez. And what's very interesting is to see that planes that have been used by the U.S. government and, for example, have appeared at uh, Guantanamo Bay, uh, they're not, it's not like ordinary planes that go and visit uh, Guantanamo, and have been chartered for various other operations. In fact, you know, the same plane that took Meher Ura uh, from John F. Kennedy to, to Syria, the, the man we discussed who was tortured in Syria, um, that plane also turned up in, in Venezuela. And it's just interesting uh, to see the dates of when these planes go to Venezuela at some pretty uh, crucial moments. But as, as I say, this is a story that uh, needs further investigation. I mention it because I think it's important that, that we find out what was going on there. In the footnotes of your book, you say the first appearance of a possible CIA plane in Venezuela was March 4, 2002, one day before the coup that temporarily ousted uh, President Hugo Chavez. Uh, the possible CIA planes also returned to Venezuela on November 19, 2002, December 6, 2003, January 3, 2004, September 3, 2003, September 4, 2003, November 9, 2004. Now, doesn't Chavez know these planes are flying in? I don't know. They don't come saying CIA on, on, on them. They come uh, as uh, private business jets that are coming into Venezuela. So I, I'm not sure he would know who was on board. It, it wasn't the actual day before the coup. It was the day before there was a, a, a plan signed to, 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 right, to, to remove Chavez. Right, the coup was in April. Yeah, right. exactly. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting, very interesting area. I, I've concentrated on, on looking at the role of these planes in, in rendition. Um, but I've actually printed the, in the back of the book some of the flight logs of these planes around the world and there a number of other operations they would have been involved in that would take some investigation. Is the CIA or, C or U.S. government still running secret prisons around the world? It's still holding people in secret detention, and there are many people hidden in that system. I think that what's happened is uh, with the demands of the Supreme Court that the U.S. follows the Geneva Conventions, which do provide for rights of prisoners wherever they're held, um, to be brought before a court of law, uh, to be held according to civilized standards. They've shut down many of the facilities for now, although they've been a kind of given a new lease of life this week with uh, new, new, new legislation. What's happened if people have been disappeared into foreign facilities? And you can look at some very key people. I mentioned, um, well, I mentioned the case of Ibn al-Sheikh al-Libya, a very key supposed al-Qaeda operative, provided some of the false information under interrogation that was used as an argument by Colin Powell to take this country to war in Iraq. That happened after he was rendered to Egypt. He was brought back into U.S. custody, was held in Afghanistan, and now he's completely disappeared. So it's quite chilling, really, when the president stands up and says these jails are empty, because it makes you wonder, what have they done with everyone else? Where have they put them? You know, um, There are hundreds of people that were captured in Afghanistan, for example that were not sent to Guantanamo, that were sent elsewhere, either held within Afghanistan or sent to other countries. And when they say the jails are empty, it's quite frightening because you think, well, where have they put all these people? And it's still quite a mystery. Stephen Gray, we're going to have to leave it there. His book is called Ghost Plane, the true story of the CIA torture program. And that does it for today's broadcast.